Tonight, uh, I'm really going to talk with you about what makes good education. Don't worry about that. The, so the, there are many ways to think of, that's a lot of my fishing pictures. You don't want to say those things. Now, what the, all of us today, you as parents, teachers, business leaders, or government officials, you all want to improve education. I'm sure everyone wants to make your education better, right? But what is an education? What is a good education? Today, we're really at a, at a very hard time. Uh, I have uh, several questions to ask you to, to begin with, with some data. Because I lived in China for so many years, and then I have lived in the US for about 20 years. And then I spent a lot of time in England and Australia and different places just to understand what makes a good education. China, as many of you probably know, uh, China has been doing great. Everybody now, it's, it's a good time to be Chinese. It's a very good time. It's, it's a, this is a good time to be Chinese. Everything, China has got everything right. So I have um, the first big question I tend to ask is that, uh, you know, China, we call, why did not China have a big party? You, you may want to know, why should China have a big party? You know, China, this is not the the Communist Party. You know, China's Communist Party actually is very big. It's uh, 80 million members. This is a party to celebrate, to celebrate its education achievement. You know, the, many of you know, may, may know this test called the PISA. Have you heard of the test called the PISA test? PISA, OK. PISA, it's not the tower, OK, not it, not the tower. It spells the same way, but it's, uh, it's this uh, international tests of 15 year olds. It's conducted by the OECD in Paris. And it's done every three years of 15 year olds in math, literacy, and science. And then it started only 10 years ago, but the test is already more famous than the city or the tower now in Italy. If you go Google it, Pisa, the first thing that comes up is the test. Why is it so popular in a 3,000 year old city? I mean, that's, that's really interesting, right? Because everybody pays attention to this test. This test now has over 70 countries participating. It's uh, perhaps more important than the Olympic Games. It's more, everybody pays attention to it. So this test, uh, Spain doesn't do very, I don't think Spain does done, has done very well, I understand this test, right? It's, uh, and uh, so, China, for the first time, took part in this test three years ago. And China, you can see, ranks number one in every area, in mathematics, in literacy, and in science. And which lead many people to believe the Chinese are the cleverest people in the world. China has the best education system in the world. That's many people believe that. Before that was Finland. Remember Finland? Everybody thinks Finland is really cool, right? Actually, it's a very boring place, you know, so we get tired of Finland. I'm glad we get, China gets up there, you can lock Finland out, right? You know how important this test is? Finland, most people before, I mean, Europe, you know, but outside Europe, people before this, Finland took number one in the Pisa in 2000, most people had no idea where Finland is. Most people had no idea what Finland was. There was no Nokia, I remember the whole thing. They only imagined this little tiny little place covered by snow all year round. Right? There's you know, people drunk, get drunk by the moose. That's all they know. It's, uh, they don't know anything about Finland. But this test, PISA, made Finland an international phenomenon. Everybody knows Finland. Finland become more attractive as a tourist place than Barcelona. You should feel sad about it because they're all education tourists. They want to go to Finland and say, what made you so good? How did you produce test scores? So this time, China did. China become number one. And if you look, at the, these are the top 10 countries. 74, I don't know where Spain is. Spain perhaps would be down here. You, know, you, you can't find Spain would be down there, right? Some, somewhere down there. So take this test. China was number one. So everybody's trying to understand how China did become number one. And everyone now has their eye on China. They think China has the best education achievement. So China should become an international benchmark, become a goal. In America, they published a book called Surpassing Shanghai. 
So they believe China has the best education. Everyone should go after China, surpassing Shanghai. And this become the international, I mean, national agenda for America. You know, America used to have very big dreams. Do you remember America? That's why you go to America, they, have a, they had a dream to say, let's build a country without kings and queens. That was a big dream. They were ending slavery. They sent people to the moon. Those were big national dreams. It was very interesting, exciting dreams. Then George Bush came along. Remember there was a president called George Bush? Yeah. And his national dream was become reading. They said, let's read. It was very boring. You know, it was a very boring dream. I know reading was very hard for George Bush. But that's a personal goal. That should not be a national goal. That never should be working in, in those things. And now they get surpassing Shanghai as a national goal. America is getting worse in this regard. And there's many other countries admire China's achievement. Australia, they say China are two years ahead of Australian kids on this test. Chinese students, 15 years, are two years better in mathematics than students in Australia. And in America, there are people admiring China in everything. This was a governor from Pennsylvania, Ed Randell, when they had a football game canceled due to winter storm. He was very unhappy. He said, uh, America has become a nation of usis. Is the Chinese are kicking our butt in everything. Is that if uh, China, if, uh, if this was in China, would think the Chinese would have caught off the game. People would have walked, and they would have been doing calculus on their way down to the stadium. So this is a very strange way of thinking about China. And in England, there's your close. Michael Gove, the British Secretary of Education said, I'm happy to confess, I'd like us to implement a cultural revolution just like the one they have had in China. They want to be more like China again. But China, I can see, tell you, despite all this international admiration, everybody thinks China should be celebrated. But China did not. They did not have a party to celebrate. You want to say why? The why is actually very simple because China, as the premier Wen Jiabao said, China needs a Steve Jobs. China needs many Steve Jobses. They need creative entrepreneurs, but China is not producing them. And they said China cannot produce a Steve Jobs or entrepreneurs or creative people to save the country, China is a country built on cheap labor. And those, that economy is in danger because the laborers are being moved to other countries. I mean, the, the jobs for cheap labor are being moved to other countries like Vietnam. So China is struggling to produce more patents. If we look at these numbers, China has 20% of the world's population, 9% of the world's GDP, but only 1% of the patents filed internationally. And half of the 1% are actually not made by Chinese companies, or by multinational companies. Now imagine China with um, 1.3 billion people. That's four times that of the US, right? So statistically speaking, China would have more baby Steve Jobs born. More baby Steve born, right? But what happened to the baby Steve Jobs? So that's the big question. And their answer is that China's good ex education, excellent education, has actually killed the baby Steve Jobs. So that's the answer. The best education produce the worst kind of talents. That's China's thinking. So it, does the PISA mean anything? They have another question for you. I may not have given you an answer, but I have a lot of questions for you. The second big question is, why is America still here? I live in the US, you know, I'm a Chinese, so I'm, I'm trying to understand these two countries. There's two very contradictory countries. Why is America still here? This is a, some, sounds like a terrorist kind of question. Why are you still here, America, right? It's, many people want America to be gone, but it's still here. This is actually a serious education question. You, you, you hear, actually you read, say, American education is getting worse and worse. Actually, all international tests, all over the US, people say American education is in crisis. It's getting worse, it's in decline. But I can tell you, American education, historically speaking, is not in decline, is not getting worse. It has always been horrible. 
It's, uh, it's always been, always been bad. It's, uh, because it's, you say, it, if it has always been bad, why America as a country is still here, right? Because you believe a good education is the foundation of a good economy, of a good society. So how bad has America been? I'm just going to show you one slide. If you look at international tests, in the 1960s, 1964, that's almost half a century ago, American students took part in this first international mathematics study. First international mathematics study. American students ranked 12th out of 12 countries. That's at the bottom. So America, you cannot get worse than that, right? If you start 1964 as their lowest, you can only get better. So America has had over half a century of really bad students judged by those tests. But why is America still here? Why those children have not destroyed America? You know, for example, you look at the, not only that, President Obama. By the way, do you know that in Barcelona there's a restaurant called Obama? Do you know that? Obama, Af British Africa, we had lunch there, it was fun. And they employed a Chinese there to work in. But in the, it said, Obama said, America still has the largest, most prosperous economy. No workers are more productive than ours. No country has more successful companies. These are actually very true. I mean, sometimes what the president says is not necessarily true. What I call these are facts. These are more factual than some other facts you know, he has. It's very good. It's, um, now, so there's two big questions now. Okay. Now we have another question. You know, everybody think you think going to college is a good thing, right? Everybody believes we should go to college. Right? Going to college, you, you go to school, you go to college. So the college is going to get you ready for a job. But that's actually not happening. Uh, there was a new book coming out from uh, the US called A Generation on Tight Ropes uh, it's by American college students. You know, a lot of more college students are getting A's. Over 70% of students have an A or A minus in grades, compared to about 6-7% 40 years ago. So people are getting good grades. More students are going to college. And everybody's thinking we're doing better. But this is something very sad that's happening is that we're finding a lot of people not getting caught not getting jobs. For example, here's some data. College graduates in America right now, 53% of students graduate from college do not have jobs. Which is very sad. You think that that's America's problem. You can blame on the recession. Now let's go to Korea, who does not have a recession. The same problem. You go to China, the same problem. College graduates don't have jobs. You go to well, Spain, I don't have to say that about Spain, you know that very well. And you go to South Africa. South Africa, over 600,000 students don't have jobs. So we pay for college. We have the students get ready for college, but there are no, no jobs for them. You say, why? So this question is, why is China not celebrating its outstanding education achievement test based on test scores? Why America, as a bad education country based on test scores, still doing fine? And why are so many college graduates not finding jobs? So what's the, those are big questions for us to think about. Now, if you want to think about the purpose of education, Finding jobs is one of them. So what's the purpose of good education? I have, um, I was telling you, I have my daughter here, so I can show you. I think about the definition of a good education all the time. That's my daughter, if you are looking for. <laughs> she's, uh, she's 14. I think about it. What kind of education do I want for her? Do I want to send her to America? Send her to China? Do I want her to go to college when you know half she has only 50% of a chance of finding a job, right? What, what would be? What kind of education can keep her out? Another one is that I have a son who is 21 year old. He is in college. He is at the University of Chicago. He is going to graduate next year. And I have spent a lot of money on him. It's in America, private university. So I want to know, have I 
bought a good education for him? Or has he gone through a good education? How do I know? What kind of things would I know next year, this time? So I've come to a simple conclusion. The measurement of a good education is whether my son will come back to live in my basement next year. If he graduates and can stay out of my basement, that's success for education, right? So that, that's you should measure. Ed, the ultimate goal of, of education is to keep children out of their parents' basement. So that, that's the best ed definition. Now, if he, But what does that mean? That's very hard to do nowadays. It means there's no institution can guarantee their children can do that. So let's take a look at our education's big problem. What kind of problem do we have in education? I have all this. By the way, they, all the slides is available. So I want to come down here to first to think education issues. If you look at our school today, what China does, what America does, what Spain has, what Catalonia has, is basically an education system all look like this. We start by defining what future jobs will need, right? That's how we start. We start our curriculum. We say, if you want to become an employee, a citizen of a society, we start by asking the question, what knowledge and what skills you will need. Then we make that into a curriculum. That's what we do, make that into a curriculum. The curriculum would include necessary subjects, right? You call, you call them essential or core subjects, like mathematics, language. You want to teach Spanish and Catalan, you want to teach some science. Then you say, okay, those are necessary for everybody. Then maybe add a little bit of music if you have time, right? Then maybe add a little bit of sports if you have time. Those, you know, maybe a little bit of art if you have money. That, that's right. But something we cannot miss is math, reading, right, and science. Something we don't, we, and that's why PISA tests those things. PISA tests, so we think those are very essential. And then in the process, schooling, what we do as teachers, as schools, as government, we take that and then translate them into grade level expectations, right? Each grade, by first grade, year one, you should learn this much. Year two, you should learn this much. Then we test our students to say if they understand each one of them. If they don't understand them, they don't reach the level, we retain them for a grade. And then after nine years or 18 years, we give another test. The ones who are good at taking this test, knows their stuff, go to better universities. The ones who are not as good, go to less good universities. And the ones still not good, they're kicked out of the system, right? And sometimes we kick them even earlier, you know, by grade four, by grade eight. We kick them earlier. So that's the system, and we don't care. We don't want to care individual differences. We don't want to know your interest. I mean, you, when you are a parent, you know, you may have a daughter who was, when she was five, she said, Mommy, I don't want to go to school. I want to play with my doll. You know, I want to be a dancer. He said, no, 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 you got to go to school. You can dance when you, can, when you do this thing, right? Because dancing, you know, is not going to get you a job. That's what we tell them. It's not going to get you employed. He said, I know I like to draw all the time. I want to be a painter. No, 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 no. no you can't be a painter, right? No, you can't do that. Not everyone can be a great painter, right? Just, we tell our children all that. All of this is like what we call a sausage making, right? I mean, I know in Catalan that works. You have a lot, you make some of the great big ham and sausages. You understand that idea. So what, what's the sausage making means? That you put all kinds of meat and ingredients together. You're not supposed to care what you put in as long as you produce good sausages. And what's the good sausage in education? It's test scores, right? You produce good test scores. So this is the old model. The old model actually worked very well. I was in your museum yesterday, I learned. In the 1700s, from 1400s to 1700s in Barcelona, for example, that was the age of industrialization. You know what industrialization do? You build giant factories. Once you have giant factories, what do you need? You need a lot of people working in the factory knowing the same thing and basic skills. They have to have the same knowledge, same skills, and they cannot be very creative. You know, you can dance, 
but not on assembly line, right? If you look at those textile factories, I look at the textile factories, they don't want the dancers, they don't need singers, they want people to put a stamp on it, everybody doing the same thing, repeat it every hour, every minute. That's what they do. They w don't want any creative talent people. Creative talents are not very useful. I mean, like uh, I was thinking about uh, putting cars together. You all know Lady Gaga, right? No one wants to buy a car assembled by Lady Gaga. You don't want to do that. It's, it's impossible. You can't buy that, that. So what end up, this was very useful, very, but not anymore. All our universities were built this way. Maybe we have, we have professions. You become a computer engineer, a science. We have everything lined up. We have computer science sausage. We have uh, this construction sausage. You have all kinds of sausage, but they are lined up to go find a job. But those jobs don't exist anymore. Where did those jobs go? Do you know what happened to those jobs? This is, this is something very dangerous thing about jobs. Here's something about uh, jobs. Okay, let me see. Let me show you. This is in America, but this happens all over the world in developed countries. America has lost millions of jobs in the manufacturing sector, making things. Those manufacturer jobs read on assembly line jobs. We need a lot of people doing similar things. Think about Ford Motor Company. They hire a lot of people. But what happened to those jobs? Number one, they have been replaced by robotics, robots, machines. They have been com computerized. I bet just 30 years ago in Barcelona, you have many people working in the banks, bank tellers in the front desk, you know, counting cash to you. Now they're replaced by machines. We call them ATMs. Just 10 years ago, airline check-in, you cannot do it at home. Now you do it at home. Remember, they had used you go to the airport, a lot of people standing there, check you in. Not anymore. That has changed. So it has replaced a lot of people. We call automation. The second place they've gone to, they've gone to lower cost labor places. We call that offshoring. I'm sure Barcelona has lost a lot of textile jobs to Southeast Asia and China. You've lost a lot of to them. Why? Because your labor costs more, you have better education, the standards of living rises. In China, where I come from, my villagers never had good education. What they can do, they can do manual work. That, that's what they do. So if you, those two things has cost massive disappearance of jobs. So people, the people we try to prepare our students to, they don't have jobs. That's very simple. And now, if you look at this diagram, this is the dis global distribution of the, pro of the money for the iPhone. You know, when you buy the iPhone, you want to say, where did my money go? When you pay, pay $300, where did your money go? You can't believe it, 58% went to Apple computers as profit. 2%, that's the red part, went to China. 2% went to China. But look at this one, Apple computers had only 43,000 workers. China had over 700,000 workers. What do Chinese people do, the 700,000 workers? They do something very simple. They put the glass on the iPhone. They cut the glass. Because this cannot be done by machines. It has to be done manually. They make much less money. So this is the whole distribution. And there's some money went to EU, some money went to Korea, some went to materials, some went to Japan. That's how you think about this globally. So now, then there's another problem with new jobs too. Is that today, innovations kept coming. Facebook, Twitter, Skype, but all of these new innovations, what they don't do, they don't create big number of jobs. They don't have assembly lines, like Facebook. Facebook was nearly a hundred billion dollar company. General Motors, the car maker, is only 35 billion dollars. But Facebook does not need factory workers. Facebook employs less than 10,000 workers. So today's innovation do not create a lot of jobs either. So that's basically makes us put all us human beings in a very bad situation. We call this as economical recession, many people call it, 
But some other economists said this is an economical resetting. Resetting, not recession. That's why when the, when the, in the U.S., for example, we seem to be climbing out of the recession. Everything is going up. GDP, investment, all those other lines means the good part. The corporate profit, tax, everything's going up. Only thing is going down is employment. That means, actually, we are somehow climbed out of the recession if you measure by other things. But if you measure by employment, we are still in a recession. It's a resetting. Simply, we have entered a different economical stage that we need different types of workers now, not the same kind of workers as we had before. So if you look at um, another diagram, this is the new age, new economy. When the working class is in decline, the service class is on the rise. Service class means low-level workers. You don't need anything that's like a Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg in Spanish, right? Zuckerberg, he doesn't need a lot of factory workers, but he still needs someone to bring him coffee or sweep his floor, right? That's the service he needs. That's low-level workers. But the other line, the creative professionals and super creative core is on the rise. Agriculture is almost done. So this is where we need to be. What we need is people who will recreate the economy. We do, not need, uh, we do not need millions of workers doing the same things. We need a lot of individuals doing different things. So what I would suggest, many people say, the new middle class, the new middle class will have to be the creative class. The new middle, is the cre the new middle class is people who will create things, who will make things. So schools to continue to make create employees. That's why we failed. But when we need entrepreneurs. So you want to explain the three questions I raised in the beginning. Why did not China celebrate? China was good at making employees, test scores, test scores. So all the international tests, the PISA, TIMS, if you look at any of those tests, you don't mind. They simply measure how well, how good a school or nation is at making employees. No matter what it is, they're basically trying to test how well your system is making your students comply with the prescribed content. Basically, they're assessing what, how good are you as a sausage maker. That's it. That's all. If you're interested in making sausage, you should compete. If you're not interested in making sausage, you can't ignore it. That's basic idea. I would say sausage making, the age of sausage making is done. You don't just want to eat sausage anymore. You still need a little bit of sausage. You have expanded your taste into vegetarian. Right? So if you move into a vegetarian society, sausage making is not going to be as important. The same thing when you now move to drive automobiles, horseshoe making is not going to work. You don't need horseshoe makers, right? So our schools have been making entrepreneurs. When Emma was talking about all our reforms in Spain, in France, in Germany, in Finland, Australia, all these countries are still working to make your schools a better sausage making machine. That's why they want to say, okay, maybe our students do not perform well on the PISA is because our curriculum is not good. So they began to fix their curriculum. I mean, that's why that's why it's okay. Let's make our curriculum internationally competitive. Let's say what Finland has in curriculum. So we're gonna fix our prescription. Maybe our teachers are not working hard. So we want to punish them or reward them by basing their salary or evaluation on student test scores. Maybe our schools spend too much time on something else. Let's focus our students. So we're still only trying to perfect in our sausage making capacity. This is like debating. We're trying to fix the horse wagon. Remember horse, you had a horse wagons, right? We're trying to fix a horse wagon to fly to the moon, right? We're debating how many horses do we need if we want to fly to the moon? 
That, that's we're still debating. How big a wheel should we do? All this debate now about teachers, about schools, is not working because there are several things I have to show you. This is several things we've been arguing a lot. That's from Emma's conversation. In education, there are four things we all know. This is, there's really no disputes in educational research science. Number one, human nature is diverse. We are very different. We are born different, and then once we are born, we are born to different families, different cultures. So when we go to school, we are very differently talented. Some people are good at music, some good at art, some good at dancing, some good at math, some good at science. So this we call multiple intelligences. So we are very different. And when we are very different, there's another problem too. You cannot be great in everything, okay? So don't, don't think, you know, if you're good at art, you can't be automatically good at sports. You may, but it's very unlikely. Normally, when you are great at something, you must be bad at something else. You know, Albert Einstein, right? We think he is great. He was. He was great, a great physicist, but he was not that great in mathematics. He himself said he, he wished he was good at math. He can play the violin, but he's a very bad husband and father, right? He was horrible in the social relationships. So you can't be great in everything. <laughs> That's number one thing we need to accept that. So when students come to our schools, if you look at the traditional sausage making machine, you know, this student may not be good sausage, but is good bacon. Right? So what do you do? You try, he, you, you make him a very bad sausage. That's what actually Albert Einstein said the same thing. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it would be a stupid fish. Right? So if you want, that's part of our schools do that. Sausage making, we do that. We do not celebrate the individual difference. We look at those people who have talents that's not fit our curriculum. We think they're bad. That's the first problem with the sausage making. Schools become a selection mechanism, not an education mechanism. We select. We have kicked out a lot of systems. So if you want to explain the PISA scores, Basically, countries who are good at selecting, reducing people, have better scores. If students are more willing to, willing to comply, willing to obey, they test better. Like Singapore, China, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, all those countries are very good at this. Because when you are not, if you are not good, you do not get to advance and undergrade. So they produce very good scores, then you lose others. The second thing is that we know the economy has changed. I've shown you that. We have moved from mass production to personalized consumption. What talents, the talents that used to be not to be useful become very useful. We have entered people call the age of abundance. That means in the age of abundance, we have we consume very different things. If you I'm giving you two examples about consumption, about how useful talents have become, different talents. When I went to America, I, I was born in a little village. You know, it's, I'm gonna show my little village. And in my little village, we had only one thing that was very useful. So I, I took, just to give the example of Lady Gaga versus my village. Okay, so my village is in Sichuan. We plow with water buffaloes. Just think about that. When I, I, t I was trying to tell my father, my father still lives there. He's 85 years old. He's illiterate. So I asked him, would Lady Gaga be useful in our village? Can you imagine that in a Sichuan prop village? But Lady Gaga is oh, worth $100 million, right? So I asked my father, would she be useful? My father said, no, she cannot be useful in our village. She actually would be a problem because she wears meat. Remember that? That's all. We don't have enough meat for her. She has to go to another place. She cannot drive the water buffalo, right? She cannot. Now, why is Lady Gaga useful in other places? 
It's a very interesting question to think about. Now think about in my village, the most useful talent is the ability to handle a water buffalo. A singer, a writer, if you think about J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter author, would be very, you know, she makes more money than the queen in England, but she would be useless in my village. I was useless in my village, so I had to leave. You know, you have to think about. So when I went to America, I found this completely changed. That the age of abundance consume different talents. When I went to America, the first thing I noticed was the lawns, grass. If you have been to America, I'm mean here too. People grew a lot of grass in front of their house, right, and the backyard. You notice that, and they spend a lot of money to grow the grass. And I found that's completely purposeless. There's no purpose. The only purpose is you grow and you cut it, right? The purpose of growing the grass becomes cutting the grass. You think it's completely absurd, right? You think, why do they do this? Because we consume different products. Now, in that process, in that process, you know how many new jobs they have created? But those jobs had nothing to do with producing things that's necessary for human beings. It's, no necess it's not necessary. You create those jobs. Another thing I found is in America is that, uh, you know how much money we spend today advertising for food? You go to your buses, TVs, we te television, all the, how many different ways to wrap food? Do you notice the food, the packaging, drinks, all those things? All of them, we spend so much money convincing people to eat. Do you think that's necessary in Africa, in my village? You don't need to convince me. I, I'm just, I don't need any of those decorations. We convince people to eat, and then we convince you to lose what you just eat. We send you to gyms, right, to athletic clubs to lose that what weight. And then we, in those athletic clubs, you know how many different clothes they make, shoes they make, the different machines they make, and the personal trainers, coaches to tell you how to lose the weight, right? You think, do you think that's absurd for human beings? But we have them. We create different kind of jobs. The age of abundance most of us are living today now is not about necessity. It's about psychological and cultural needs. I mean, some of the ladies have beautiful bags there, right? You don't need that bag. You just feel good with that bag. You know, it costs maybe a hundred dollars, five hundred euros to buy it. It holds no more than a plastic bag, but you but you like to carry it. It's it's you love it. Now think about who design what you're buying. You're buying other talents. The traditional education model were preparing people to make necessities. Now we need people to create spiritual and psychological products. Spiritual and psychological products. When you get an iPhone on iTunes, do you know how many Musicians there are on this thing? You can't believe it, right? Now, how many writers, authors were enjoying now? I mean, for, I was also thinking about Shakespeare. You think Shakespeare, William Shakespeare is great, right? But I can bet you in human history, there were thousands of William Shakespeare's born, that talents. But why did he become that famous? We only need the use of one. And he did not make much money anyway at that time. Remember, that was horrible. He was a talent, but we could not make use of him. So what you need to understand is that in this new age, the new economy, as I was talking about, is that we can make use of great talents. Any talent is very all valuable now. So that's the second big change we need to think about. Then we have the third big change, big thing that out in the knowns is information. Today, information is everywhere. I don't have to explain this to you. If you want to know something, you really can find out. The problem is you don't know what you want to know, right? You don't even know what you want to know nowadays. So for schools, for our government to make sure our teachers can still teach, can still be able to transmit the information to students, that's absurd. Students, if they want to know something, they can find the information more up-to-date more interesting than their teacher can provide. So today, if you can Google everything, why do you need a teacher? But our system still trying to fix that, trying to make teachers better teachers in teaching. That's, again, something wrong. And finally, globalized. The current education reform trying to make our students to compete with others, to make sure our students, like in Catalan, in Spain, 
to outscore, to score better than the French, than the Germans, than the English, than the Chinese. It doesn't make sense at all. Even if you outscore them, you won't have a job. Something like this, even if Spanish kids take a score, have better scores than Chinese kids, you won't be able to compete for the same jobs because you cost more. It's very simple. That's something you can't deny that. What you need to think about is not think about China, India as competitors. Think of them as potential customers, potential markets. That's actually what Australia just has announced. Australia just said Asia literacy is one of the primary goals. They just announced this yesterday from Prime Minister. Because they want to make sure Australians can understand Asia enough to take advantage of the rise and middle class as a market. If you understand them as a market, what does it mean? It means young Catalans or Catalania or Spanish children need to know what they need can make that can be sold in Asia. What can they make? They can work with Asian culture. How can they work collaboratively with Asia, not to compete with Asia? So we live in a globalized world. We need to think ourselves. Big question for all of us to think. On the globalized supply chain, when everybody is competing, how can you collaborate? And why do you matter? If you ask about Catalan or Barcelona, why do I matter? You could go, what makes you different from Paris, from London, from Beijing, from Shanghai? Or what makes you different? So the same thing for your students. What makes your students different from other places? So here's my suggestion. When you think about moving from preparing employees to entrepreneurs, if you want to think about moving from this, what kind of new education we need? When we talk about entrepreneurs, as Emma was helping me explaining a little bit, entrepreneurs are not only people who engage in business. Entrepreneurs are in policy, in government. Entrepreneurs are also social entrepreneurs who try to bring social change. Entrepreneurs are also, we call them, intrapreneurs, people who are creative within the organization. All of these things are called entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs is a spirit. It's something that, first of all, you do not wait for someone to give you a solution. That is our children. They need to become not job finders, seekers, but to become job creators. They need to create because nobody is going to employ them. The jobs they want have not been invented. They have to invent themselves. And how to do that? It basically means you maximize everyone's interest. So I propose very quickly that what we need to cultivate is to have a new paradigm of education. The new paradigm of education is about enhancing every individual's talent. Make everyone great. Okay? So that's a new paradigm. Remember the big one is making sausage. This one is we take whatever you are. If you're a good piece of steak, I'm going to make it into a nice steak. And I'm not going to make it into sausage. So you take that. So it has three elements. The first element is to do, if, La if Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. So that's the first belief. You have to believe this one. So the first element is that in our schools, we should have no curriculum, but everything should be personalized. Education is to enhance every child's strength, not trying to fix their deficit. So when a child comes to a school, you do not ask what you do not know. You do not try to make sure he or she does that. You want to say, what are you interested in? How can we help you become better? There was a, at, at Emma's uh, uh, seminar, we had uh, this very, very powerful, well-known psychologist from Harvard, Kurt uh, Fisher from Harvard. Uh, he, Harvard University, he studies brain and education. He was talking about a study, very interesting study, said uh, when you are strong in something, you may not be good. For example, um, you know, dyslexic people, Dys people who cannot read very well, but they are great talent for astrophysics. Because that when you are dyslexic, their vision is different. They see something differently. When they look at the sky maps, they can have a much 
better view of this that only pe those people can read. They did a study. They showed different pictures. Harvard, students from Harvard are much worse at looking at some of the peripheral details on the picture. But those visions, if you look at think about the astrophysicist, you have a broader vision doesn't help you. 200 years ago, there was no big profession of astrophysics, right? The only thing you could be become a good witch written in the sky, but not many people need witches who, who can have those visions, right? So that's changes. So since you look at these people come in, I will not try to fix you to read. I will make sure you become a great person using your per peripheral vision. You know, for example, become a game developer, 3D modeler, maybe a much better uh, stage designer. You can think of uh, interior design. People have different ways of using this. So first then, a personalized curriculum. That means everything you teach in your school follows the child. Follows the child. The second thing is that just become different is not sufficient. You have to become great. Great in something. So in a school, you have to help children to become great in what they do. How do you become great? I'm going to show you a little process. Austin, this is called Austin's butterfly. Austin is a young child who is about seven years old. This is his product. What do you think? It's for seven year old. It's pretty good, right? It's very good, I would say. But Austin did not produce this the first time. This is Austin's first butterfly. That's more like a first grader, right? Seven year seven student. He improved over about three or four weeks. You see this second draft. See, did you see the change? That's what happened is Austin was trying to draw a butterfly. The teacher didn't say anything. Only his friends in the classroom said, Austin, look at the butterfly. Do you think how big the butterfly is and how big the wing is? So he made the wing much bigger. This time they made it in a bigger. And then he get more feedback to say, Austin, you think that, look at the wing. Is wind, where's the roundness? Then he said, oh, I got to make it round. And he made it much rounder this time. Made more round this time. And he goes on like this. It's multiple revisions. That's how he get this. So this is what you need to do is in every school, we need to engage our children in making real things. There's no teaching. The teacher didn't teach. The people simply ask questions, like getting feedback. He was engaged in making a real product. So the second element of my paradigm is called product-oriented learning. That means you your, uh, make sure your children learn by making things. By making something that matters. They can be making music. They can be making art. They can be making uh, a policy. They can be making a book for anybody. But it has to be a real product. With what we sometimes call children have to make works that matter. Imagine in our, in our schools, your children go to school for 12 years, 18 years. How often they have made things that matter. Most things they produce do not matter. right? The teacher tells them something. They tell them back, they get a good grade, that's it. We have been assessing our students by how well they can tell what we tell them. How, how good they have become consumers of information, not creators. Now we need to engage in making genuine, real products. Every child, when they come with something, they love making things. And it's through making things, they learn the basics. They learn great things. That's going after them. So number one, personalized. Number two, making things. Number three, it's very simple. All of this has to occur in the age of globalization, globalized context. Our schools today are too isolated. Your children, with the use of technology, with the travel, they can't be working with the students from any other country. If you want to teach a language, for example, if, you're, if one of your child children wants to learn Mandarin Chinese, he or she should be able to do so by learning online from students in China. If your children want to learn how to do fashion design, they should be able to do so from London, globalized. At the same time, you want your children to be able to make things that's valuable to others. Like uh, I was talking to some people here. Your children here in Catalan can be making a Catalan school for students worldwide. 
They can be teach other people language. They can be writing Catalan book textbooks, you know, personalized textbooks. They can be making Barcelona history or Catalonia history and teach other people. As you all of you know this, the best way to learn something is to teach. To teach it. If you teach something and you have a global audience, because if you teach your neighbors, if you teach students in Catalan to say, I'm going to teach, teach you something about history of Catalan, people here may not be interested because they know the same thing. They have the same knowledge. But if you say, okay, I will teach somebody from Africa, that makes meaningful. So globalized, global competency, lang foreign languages, but also global partners from other places. So to summarize, I think this model is very simple. It goes like this. The new school, the new education is that the what of school is not adult prescription of the knowledge and skills make you employable. We don't need that. We start with children's autonomy, what children are good at. Because if they're good at something, if they're great at something, in this new age we call hyper-specialization, you will be useful, valuable, plus you will have the spirit to create your own thing. If you create your own thing, no matter where you are, in Bar you know, Barcelona or in some even villages here, you can be known worldwide. Worldwide, they can consume you. So you have to always think about others. So the, what, the second thing is that children have to be making things. Learning has to be about producing. Learning is not about memorization because information is everywhere. Teachers in this process is not someone to teach something, but is someone to motivate, to provide feedback, to provide support. And all of this has to happen in the context of the global campus. So all of this, what I want to say, show you that is that just one little diagram to show why. PISA scores, everybody admires the PISA scores. The red bars are the ranking of countries on math in PISA. Okay, Spain was somewhere here. Spain wasn't, actually you were almost the last in terms of math scores, okay? But then if you look at, there's another data, piece of data called entrepreneurial spirit. The entrepreneurial spirit. Spain is actually not that bad. You Spanish, you guys are quite creative in many ways. So countries have high math scores, has low entrepreneurial spirit. Look at uh, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Finland, and Switzerland, Japan, you look at these countries. So somehow, the traditional model has a side effect. When you drive up the test scores, you may lose confidence. You may lose the spirit. You look at the PISA scores, go negatively correlated with all other entrepreneur spirit. Just, you know, the, the point is that we have something called side effects. The, look at this, this piece of data. People love this piece of data. This is test scores. American students in 2003, in math scores, as usual, ranked way below Asian countries. They're always worse than Asian countries. But on the same test, they ask another question about confidence. Say, so are you confident you can do well in mathematics? You can expect Americans are horrible or stupid in mathematics, but they are very confident. You know, this. So you say the Americans, so they're confident that anybody else, they're most confident, they think, they think they can do well in mathematics. Look at uh, Singapore has number one in math scores, 18% confident. America, almost bottom, 40% confident in math mathematics. But they have a negative correlation. So what does this whole talk mean? The traditional education, sausage making, we lose entrepreneur people in two ways lose creativity. One is that we get rid of the people who are like Lady Gaga. Because they're not useful, they're not good at traditional, we get rid of them. The second thing, we damage their spirit. We tell them you're not good enough. We, because that's not in their domain, we lower their confidence. But confidence and entrepreneur spirit are the most important elements of all this learning. So many of you were thinking about this. This is what I will end. If our education can produce the following, we'll become very successful. We are producing confident people, people who know how to make friends, people who can take risks. You know, standardized test scores do not, re do not reward risk-taking. 
right? Because you take standardized test, that's that tells it's more uh, reward your ability to find the answer fast, not trying to ask questions. Then you have to the global competency, creativity, uniqueness, empathy. So to end, the best education, the education can keep all your children out of your basement. Remember, we started by saying that, out of basement. The education that can solve our problem of 53% of people not finding jobs is completely different. It's to follow the child. It's today we're so lucky. All human nature, all our diverse talents can be useful and can be valuable. So we should become an education that's trying to teach less so our children can learn more. That we, with less imposition of knowledge, so they can become more curious. We should encourage our children to be themselves. Well, I mean, they, there's a, a lot of rankings. The most recent ranking I saw is from the Gallup poll, showing that uh, Singapore is the most emotionless country. Singapore people have no emotions. They basically, they said 36% uh, of them don't feel either negative or positive over the day. They say Singapore is a, a, a nation of machines. So that, that's basically the idea. So Singapore, and the ranking. Uh, by the way, you you are you are doing fine. Then the the Spanish are doing fine. You are very emotional, and you. That's uh, so that they, they rank because they think uh, the lack of emotion indicates the lack of happiness in the country or misery, maybe both ways, right? Just it's uh, it's so that that there's all kind of rankings, and I think the rankings uh, like this basically mean that uh, there's a market. People like to say all the rankings, and and people have this simple drive to compete. You know that how, I mean, you look at the, your team, your Barca versus uh, the Real Madrid, and uh, look at this. People like to compete. What you're competing, really? Just you, I, I've been mean, understand this this competition. Human beings like to compete. Like parents, you want to know your children are scoring better than other children, right? They are getting better scores, better grades. This drive actually used to be very valuable for human beings because when they, you have to know more to get the resources. Now, when you diversify, it doesn't mean much. So if you look at rankings like this, look at different indicators. You know, we have different university rankings the same way. You know, some universities rank higher because based on research, you should based on income, based on money, or any ranking when you look at this. I don't know how it's going to play out with the, the data I have over here. Is any data you look at, you should look at very carefully what are they based on. So for example, the, the PISA data is simply based on how well students took those tests. I wouldn't read any more than that. If you want to say, okay, that means global competitiveness, no. That doesn't mean, like this one, if it's based on number of publications, China has grown great scientific publications, but if you look at another data, number of citations, the Chinese publication is not cited very well because their self-publication, they're of low quality. You produce a lot of numbers, but it has no impact. So any of these rankings, I'll be very careful. That's I advise as parents, as schools, as government leaders, look at any of the rankings very carefully and want to decide, do you want to run this race? Is the end is exactly what you want? You know, you can start ranking. You can start your Barcelona ranking of uh, diversity. You can begin ranking other school systems, how diverse you are. Boy, but Finland will be ranked at the bottom because there's the most too homogeneous. They don't have any other diversity. So you can do something like that. Yeah, you may should start like the Bofield Foundation ranking of education systems. That'll be very good. So by the way, uh, the this is my website. The the slides I use tonight you can download. I've made a lot more slides than I could use. There's a lot more data in there. And you can follow me on Twitter. I feel welcome to email me. And this is the, the book that Emma was mentioning. If you're interested in any of the details, how do we do it? Actually, you can make the book is available. And I welcome if someone wants to translate into Spanish, it would be good. I know some newspaper has been writing about this book in Spanish, but uh, you know, if you want to translate, it will be fine. I can maybe use Google can do it. I want to say something about entrepreneurial education. First of all, it's not a course. You cannot just teach entrepreneurial skills by teaching a course or a club. Uh, as I was showing those ta talents, 
entrepreneurship, it really means a whole process of education. So come back to your number one question. Change, of course, is very hard. And uh, changing teachers is extremely hard. You know, like changing parents. Adults, for many years, we have believed we hold knowledge. We can teach someone. That's true. I mean, we never believe our children know anything. But you know, look at human. It's, this is like democracy. It's democracy for students. You want the students to be able to participate. All the excuses dictators have is that people cannot manage themselves. Right? For thousands of years, human beings have always been controlled by dictators, by emperors, by queens. They don't believe in democracy. And democracy is very messy. Actually, in China right now, the government still says that the people cannot handle democracy. It's the, the same thing when adults say children cannot manage themselves. It's actually, if you look at children, any modern children research, children know a lot more than we believe. Children are not more responsible. So I would suggest the first thing to teach teachers is to ask them to look at how children work when they're self-organizing, how resourceful they are. You know, children actually perhaps are much more responsible than we think. We need to give them that. And do not be distracted by the few things we, we see. You know, uh, Winston Churchill said it's the same thing. Democracy is the worst form of government except all others that have been tried, right? It's, that's the same idea. So I think I would train teachers first to really to appreciate what teacher students can do. That, that, when I was trying to train bilingual teachers from China to teach in the US, I asked them, when they're teaching American students Chinese, I ask them not to teach them Chinese. Just, just talk to them in Chinese. They wouldn't believe. They say, how can I do it? I say, that's how we do it. As mothers, you never teach your children a language. You interact with them. So that's one thing. The first core for teachers is to appreciate what students can do. The second thing with teacher change is I think all our schools needs to also understand that buy into this belief that whatever you teach children is not very valuable, actually. What you think you're teaching them. Children construct their own knowledge anyway. That's constructivism. It's you create an environment. And the third one is teachers should be evaluated differently. Today, we evaluate teachers. We certify teachers by how much they know. You know, in schools, we prepare teachers. We want to say, do you know the content? No, that's not important. You can't know more than Google. Okay, that's the one thing. This, this, then secondly, we evaluate how effectively you transmit the knowledge. That means I find all different tricks to make sure children learn the same thing. They said, no, that's not important. The most important is, do you motivate students to learn? You know, how well can you motivate the students to learn? And how well do you construct an environment that can satisfy the needs of individual children? So that, that's it. Then the uh, other part is about, um, about students. This is actually qu quite interesting about, about children. Do you know today, our children, since they're so different, we, in our schools, we only celebrate academic success. We only celebrate academic success. We make our other children suffer. This is discrimination. I call them talent-based discrimination which is really bad. In America, it's getting worse. In poor areas, it's getting worse. Because, you know, you said, if you are not good at reading, you cannot go play. You know, that's a depri deprivation of the children's rights to play. Do you know that? Play is very important, too. If you cannot do the math, you cannot go swim. Do you remember that? That's bad. Do you remember there was a, a great American swimmer called Michael Phelps? Remember? He was ADHD. He would not be good at reading. If you want to make sure he still he can read before he can swim, he will still be hooked on phonics. You know, not, not being able to read at all. He couldn't do anything. So the segregation idea is that that's why, to be fair, all school should really allocate enough resources to any kind of talent people want to pursue. You cannot say just because I don't like this, therefore I'm bad. So that's segregation, all we call tracking. It's horrible, you know. What we do is you do personalize, you follow the child. So that's, that's something, I think that's something that should be easy to do. If a government wants to hold schools accountable, if as a parent I want to find a school, if the school is doing a good job, I won't ask you 
do you have a broad curriculum, a flexible arrangement to allow every child to have something interesting to do? As adults, many of you perhaps remember this, but you are all successful academic and all of you. Think about your, all your friends have been kicked out of the school, have dropped out. We engage, schools only engage about 30% of the students. But 70% of students are not engaged. And when you go to high school, it's even more. Why people drop out? They are not interested. They, are feel, they feel they are not valued. So that's something we need to change. If you look at the, our schools, really, probably take care of really about third person of the students. I love you know, the history part of it. So the, the big part of the history is we always think tomorrow is a photocopy of yesterday. That's our biggest problem. We always think tomorrow is going to be repeating yesterday. Uh, but I, like, uh, I, wonder, uh, I was reminded by saying by Saudi Arabia oil minister, it was a very really fabulous talk in the 1970s. He said, uh, remember, the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. The Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones. The same thing as things change much faster than we think, especially now. So I would like to think, the only thing I want to call your attention to is this book called... Uh, the coming, uh, the coming prosperity, which is really a fabulous book, is economics book. It really talks about how, over the past perhaps two decades, the world has been engaged in this argument over global competition. We're trying to argue fairness of trading, you know, WTO saying how China is stealing jobs from America, from England. People have been squabbling about all those things. He says that actually. Globalization and technology presents tremendous opportunities for prosperity, but we need entrepreneurs to solve this problem so we can move on. It's like the global international organizations like UN, UNESCO, uh, like all of those don't really do a good job. The World Bank, we need individuals to drive that. Here's come to your issue. He actually puts down human rights, puts down water, environmental sustainability. Those are entrepreneur activities. We need a lot more individuals to get engaged in in doing this thing so we can bring the coming prosperity. He used a term called the new entrepreneurs. It's a new class. He called them the black collar workers. Remember, this is an interesting term. Black, you know, we had a blue collar, white collar. He said, now black collar workers. The term he said inspired by Steve Jobs, the Apple computer's black turtleneck. You know, Steve Jobs always a black turtleneck. He said, called black collar workers. So this is the new class that's going to need it. And which really comes back to what you were talking about. I want to address that, then we'll come back to you about talents. When I talk about talents, interest, yes. Talents, difference, a lot of debate about this. Are, are entrepreneurs born or made? For example, a Steve Jobs uh, become Steve Jobs because his parents are more entrepreneurial than others. The answer is always we call yes and yes. It's called nature via nurture. You know, not nature versus nurture, but in nature via nurture. That means you are born with some propensity. There are some people are born to it. They are born innately better at doing something than others. Language, running, risk taken, that's part of entrepreneur. They are both. But that's not sufficient. You can be taught to be less risk taken. For example, come back to the question about culture. In China, as a culture, in the East Confucius culture generally suppresses differences. They want to emphasize social harmony. In a social harmony means you generally don't have different opinions from others. So you can be taught to be less, you are not rewarded for being different. Uh, well, in the US, they reward you to be different. There's research about something very simple. If you draw a picture, young children, art, piece of, the Chinese always want to justify their art by how much closer, how it resembles the original thing, how close we are, or justify by citing something that has been done. This is like somebody else. Americans always talk about how different it is from others. You know, when we were kids, they, when Chinese um, children go to school, the parents always tell the child to say, go to school, study well, make sure you follow the teacher's directions. 
You know, that's it. In America, we never tell kids. We tell kids, go to school, enjoy yourself. That's basically, it's, it's, it's a very different culture view. So yes, talent can be suppressed and can be enhanced. And our human brain is, is extremely flexible. We can learn a lot of things. But without the innate talent, you cannot learn to become great. You know, for example, I can, I can learn to play the violin. I can learn to do a little bit of music, but I doubt I will ever become a Justin Bieber. I doubt. I mean, I could be learn to write music even, but I don't think I become a Mozart. I don't think, you know, matter how hard I try. Do you see what the difference is? So there are certain things that are born. <laughs> but then coming back to the idea <clears throat> about you come to, especially when children have interests that do not fit in the economy, I think that's where exactly our children need to learn. When I talk about social entrepreneurs, Social entrepreneurs are people who use entrepreneur approaches to manage social businesses. You know, traditionally we have charitable organizations, but charitable organizations in the traditional way are not sufficient. They have to run as social entrepreneurs. Here I give you an example, I don't know if you like it. I never know if this is gonna offend you or gonna make you happier, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna tell you the story. I've been studying, think the spread of religion. Think about Christianity. Jesus Christ, was a very, very good social entrepreneur. Right? He started with a set of ideas. He built a gigantic f franchise. Right? Look how many big network. If he had interest in money, he would make a lot of money. But he was not interested in the whole, whole process, you know, allowed different denominations. So all this people into human rights, animal rights, they have to become, again, great. I want to say entrepreneurship is about action orientation. You have to be action oriented. A lot of our people, when they talk about interest, they do not put enough efforts. You have to suffer. That goes to your resilience. Actually, in the book, I do talk about resilience. You have to suffer. Confidence is very different from arrogance. Arrogance, when you're born, arrogance means an ignorant set of confidence. Confidence really means it's a set of resilience. You go after certain, I mean, certain but setbacks, you're still confident. Entrepreneurs really have three definite, um, four levels of definition. Number one, when an entrepreneur sees a problem, he doesn't just complain or wait for someone to solve it. He tries to take action. Steve Jobs wasn't happy with the mainframe. He wants to invent the personal computer. Many people saw that problem, but he was the one who tried to do it. The second thing is that you have a, a creative solution to an existing problem. You do not try to use something already. Third is you have the creative solution, but you put into action. You know how many people have ideas to improve the Catalan government? Oh, that's so stupid. I can do much better. Say, so take action. You know, they always criticize others. The school is bad. The politician is bad. But do something. They don't do it, right? Come up with a creative solution. Then they put into action the third one. The fourth one is they continue to sit through despite failures. Because most entrepreneurship don't start to be successful in the beginning. Okay, so that's where I think I combine those questions. Then back to you, Rin. I love your question about this <laughs> ranking, about, um, about school factors, all those things. Well, in essence, school is part of our culture. America has this kind of type of school. It's because it's culture. It's locally controlled, evolved, community-based. School reproduces the culture and is a product. So they, you cannot separate them. It's, it's part of this. The problem with the America right now is that why I put this data out is that America right now is trying to change the culture of school and the culture itself. They are trying to narrow the curriculum. They are trying to be more like China. They are trying to have more control with the national curriculum. That's why it's very dangerous. So, so it's very hard to say. America is basically committing suicide. America right now, it's education system. Australia is doing the same thing. England is doing the same thing to themselves. They're trying to have a much tighter control of what they teach. They did not realize what accidental fortune they've had. So th that's the problem. However, I mean, I really want to emphasize this one is that culture and schools, any of those things, can be gradually shifted, changed. A culture can be very open, flourishing. Think about, again about the... the European culture from the, the Roman Empire, Latin, and then to the medieval ages, you know, then you have one control, one type of thoughts, then you have to have the Renaissance to open again. Culture can shift. So what do we need to do? Schools often the places for you to shift culture. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the American president, once said, 
The philosophy in the classroom of this generation is the philosophy of the government next generation. That's basically what, what we do. So schools play a very important role, what we do in schools. We do actually have make judgment about people and the moral values of individuals. And however, I want to come to say about the a diversity of value judgment. For example, you may not like Justin Bieber being in line with Mozart, but if you try to talk to the fans of Justin Bieber, they may not agree with you. you know, I think. So I don't think we can trumpet the value of others. When I was talking about this then, I'm not necessarily endorsing, let's say, Bieber over Mozart, you know, or each one of them. I don't listen to any one of them, actually. So that, that's, that's, that's the, the issue is that how do we judge as the diversity of values? When we think what's valuable, you know, for that's, I think that's big debate. Globally, we all have to be engaged. It's like religion, you know, just basically which, what kind of set of values is more valuable, other universal human values, how do we deal with that? And definitely, sec second thing is that I think uh, pure creativity actually it can be very detrimental for humanity. Sometimes, I, I'm, I'm joking about this, if uh, China can sustain such a huge population precisely for its lack of obedience for thousands of years. Otherwise, I mean, creativity comes from a lot of destruction. I mean, Western Europe is through all the wars, all this creative industrial revolution came about. You know, we become better at making weapons, we become science, technology. Is that good fundamentally? I think now what I'm arguing right at this moment is that creativity has thrown human beings into this mess. This problem, the only way to get out is, out, is through creativity. But I think somehow what we need to do is to consider on a global, in a global context how diverse we are in human beings and how greedy the human nature can be in the essence, that we have to balance all of So in the global context, is is not about rich. So I'm glad that we have this outreach. But that's the issue, is our students, if you look at our students, we're not even engaged in this level of conversation. We're not engaged to question. If we won't have a Steve Jobs, we must have a counter Steve Jobs coming out. There must be some people doing something like that. But we're not doing enough of them. Look at the green movement. So I think any of education, we need to come down to this level. And of course, not all entrepreneurship is moral. We got plenty of people, look at the, the, the bankers, you know, look the, through the whole thing, it's a human greatness. But again, that I would blame schools. I don't blame them because they were in our school, somehow we did not teach them enough. The, or is that maybe school is less powerful than doing that? When we complain about crooked in the politicians, greedy bankers, entrepreneurs, we have to rethink about themselves. So when I'm talking about endorsement, I make this argument pre purely today using economic arguments because right now that's the argument in the policy circle in government. And international organizations only use economical measures to judge the value of education. And today I framed in that way. I, I myself, actually, if you read the book, it's a very different set of uh, argument. But I think that's the argument most people can uh, actually latch onto. When I present with the human values about education, most of the business sectors shut me down right away and said, yeah, right, you can be happy without making money. So I have to use the economic argument. Now back to the, uh, the entrepreneurship course question. I want to actually talk to you. Okay. Anyway, so, so you, you're right. There are entrepreneur courses. Actually, there are entrepreneur PhD degrees. There's entrepreneur master's degrees. There's a lot of research. There's a, many business schools began to teach entrepreneurship because they don't train managers anymore. There's nothing to manage. They want to become entrepreneurs. What my point was not to say there's no entrepreneurship course. I want to say that entrepreneur thinking needs to be applied to the whole education process. Entrepreneur thinking is, in essence, about individuals taking action on their beliefs. That, that's basically, so it's, you should be training all other teachers to teach in the entrepreneurial way. Because sometimes our schools can think, oh, we need to train entrepreneurs. We need to, create, uh, to teach creative people. Let's run a creative class, or an entrepreneur class. It's not sufficient. So I'm so happy you're doing this in your class. And to, do, to engage your children into entrepreneurial, actually back to you, in, in my book, actually in the work I'm doing now, we are creating platforms to train students to become entrepreneur thinkers is to use what they learn, use their assets to be of service to others. 
So for example, we are building this global language institute. Children from different countries can engage in teaching their own language to people in other countries. In Katna, again, for, you can build a Katna school in your teaching language to teach Chinese Katna or Katna history. Because just to make sure their knowledge, their ability can be of service to other people going over this way. Back to Obama. Obama is not doing a good job. I, I, but I want to have, Obama is trying to standardize everybody. And teacher autonomy can be interpreted in two ways. I want to be very careful on school autonomy. Sometimes, or student autonomy, you know about personalization, personalized learning, differentiated instruction. The one old way to think is that we want you all run to the same destination. But you can take different routes. So you, we want you to take, get the same scores. I don't care how you learn that. I don't care how you teach that. That's the, this right now, the dominant model of reform in different countries is like that. I want you to get the same scores in math, but how you get there, I don't care. That's called autonomy. I don't think that's real autonomy. That's basically say, you want, I want you to be kind of obedient to me as long as, you know, I don't care how you come become this. This true autonomy is teachers become more human beings. They teach following their interest, following their passion. Today, a lot of teachers have become more professional trainers, not someone who wants to drive. You look at some of the music teachers, music coaches. They're really good because sometimes they're driven by their passion. Thank you. <laughs>